about vectors that are functionally dependent on some scalar variable. We reviewed the rules of calculus, which thankfully uh, are the same rules that one would apply in a scalar calculus course. Um, and I want to talk about some of the things that you're seeing here on page one of the general course outline. And again, I want to make it clear that I'm not questioning uh, your ability to actually compute derivatives, but we want to kind of solidify what a derivative is. Uh, the physically important parts of a vector, as you well know, are the magnitude and the direction. Those are the physically important parts of the vector. And when vectors change, when they change smoothly uh, with respect to some independent variable, they change either or, they change their mag magnitude change or their direction changes. We want to be able to pin down how changes in magnitude and changes in direction, how those changes in the physically important parts of the vector determine its derivative. And we've got a little uh, slideshow for you to try to uh, enlighten you in that regard. Okay. So, now in the presentation that you're about to see, I decided that we would use time as the independent variable because it's probably easiest to think about things changing with time. And then, frankly, in dynamics, oftentimes we are dealing with vector functions that change with time. But I want you to, even though I'm using t as the independent variable in these notes, recognize that everything we do here <coughs> is really not dependent on, on that. I, I could have written these notes using uh, my favorite letter, squiggle, as the independent variable. But the mathematics you see developed here is not dependent on the fact that I'm using T. It's just that it's easy for us to think of things changing in time. So uh, we start off here with uh, saying, uh, let's imagine a smoothly varying vector function. And let's first of all start off with it written in terms of its physically important parts. Any vector can be expressed as a product of its scalar magnitude times its unit vector direction. And again, both of those could be changed. Uh, the first expression for derivative, and we'll keep bringing this back from time to time, would be one way to express the derivative would be to simply differentiate the product of the magnitude times the direction. And when you differentiate a product, the appropriate rule is the product rule. So you can see that that certainly is a correct way, one way to express the derivative. We're going to change the magnitude pointing in the direction of the vector itself, plus the magnitude times the time rate of change of the unit vector. Now, the first uh, part of this basically starts off by considering how magnitude changes. And that discussion starts with a very simple, obvious expression. Whenever you've got a vector with itself, the result is always the square root of vector's magnitude. Now, recognize everything here is a smoothly varying function of time. So just follow along. By the way, these notes are going to be published, so you don't have to take notes here. You can just uh, pretend you're at the movies and, and see if you can follow along. So if you take the derivative of this expression, you'll notice I'm using, uh, what rule am I using on the left-hand side? Chain rule. I'm taking the derivative of u squared with respect to u times the time rate of change of u. On the right-hand side, I'm using the product rule. And if you recognize that those two parts really are the same because the dot product is commutative, to change the order of the dot product in the first term, uh, you really are looking at this. If you divide that equation by 2, and then if you divide through by uh, the square of the magnitude, or u dot u, if you divide that equation through by that, we end up with an expression for something called a vector's strain rate. A vector's strain rate. The definition of a vector's strain rate is the, the vector's rate of change of magnitude per unit magnitude. Rate of change of magnitude per unit magnitude. And evidently, from this little development, we can see that if that's what the strain rate is defined to be, then we've also developed an equation for it. If you ever need to compute a vector's strain rate, Take the vector, compute the vector's derivative, dot those two vectors, and divide through by the square of the magnitude. Now, I might want to wonder, why did I, where have you heard the word strain before? Uh, strength of materials, obviously. And you were first introduced to the 
uh, strain, I think, in the context of the uniaxial loading. So if you had some straight specimen and well, a, with undeformed length or original length of L, and you apply a load to it, an axial load, P, we know that for an elastic material, the length will change by <laughs> some amount delta L. And I believe in that first straight materials course, you use the symbol epsilon as the axial strain. And, and it was defined as what? The change in length per unit length was the strain. The analogy here is that the length of the specimen is, analog is analogous to the magnitude of the vector. Okay. Now, and what if this load was applied over a certain period of time? If this load were applied over some period of time, delta t, I guess you can divide both sides by delta t, and you get something that says that the rate of strain is the rate of change in length per unit length. Again, the analogy of length of specimen to magnitude of vector, rate of change of magnitude per unit magnitude. That's the motivation for using the phrase strain rate, rate of change of magnitude per unit magnitude. Okay. Some simple physical geometric observations. If you're <coughs> watching a vector as it changes over time, uh, imagine that you're looking at a vector whose magnitude is increasing. If a vector's magnitude is increasing, then the rate of change of magnitude would be a positive number, yes? Mm -hmm. Therefore, the strain rate would be positive. Therefore, the dot product of the vector in its own derivative would have to be positive. And you know about the dot product. You, you're well aware of the fact that the dot product of two vectors is positive if the angle between them is less than 90 degrees, an acute angle, and it's a, a, a negative number if the angle is obtuse, greater than 90 degrees. So if you're ever able to visualize a vector and you can see that the vector in its derivative make an angle of less than 90 degrees, that's the picture that will go along with a with a vector whose magnitude is increasing. And just turn that around, if you're looking at a vector whose magnitude is decreasing, then of course, you're looking at a situation where the derivative vector is going to be like an angle of greater than 90 degrees with the vector itself. Of course, in between those two cases would be what? Uh, what if you're looking at a vector whose magnitude remains constant? Or maybe you're looking at a vector whose magnitude has reached, whose magnitude has reached a maximum or reached a minimum. Uh, any one of those cases of extreme magnitude, that would be a situation where the vector's derivative is perpendicular to it. Okay, so those are some important <coughs> observations. Uh, unit vector functions are very important to us, and we'll see why in, uh, next week. Uh, unit vector functions are very important, but of course a unit vector function is a vector function where the magnitude is not just constant, but equal to one. Uh, so uh, if you're thinking about the derivative of smoothly varying unit vectors, then that would fall into this category right here. And you can see clearly that whenever you're looking at a smoothly varying unit vector function, the derivative of the unit vector is always going to be perpendicular to it. So if this is a smoothly varying unit vector, and this is what that unit vector looks like at this instant, its derivative at this instant is going to have to lie in that yellow plane. It's going to always be perpendicular to it. OK, well, let's go back to that very first expression I had for a vector's derivative. Remember, a vector can always be expressed as a product of its magnitude times its direction. And therefore, by the product rule, uh, that's the first expression that we can have for the derivative. Now, uh, notice I've, I've divided the right-hand side of the equation into two columns, a pink column and a blue column. Is it obvious that the first term on the right is parallel to the vector? And from what I just said about smoothly varying unit vector functions, is it obvious that the second term is perpendicular to the vector? Parallel, perpendicular. Uh, what did we do on Wednesday? Did we not uh, talk about the parallel perpendicular decomposition? That every vector has a unique additive decomposition uh, relative to a special direction in terms of parallel and perpendicular <coughs> components. So as a matter of fact, if we recognize that the pink is the parallel component and the blue is the perpendicular component, I can go to those 
equations on page one of the general course outline. And I can simply say, huh, what if we choose the special direction to be u hat? And I can use, from pink, I can use the formula for the parallel component. And for the blue, I can use the formula for the perpendicular component. And that's exactly what I've done. So using the equations from page one of the general course outline, parallel perpendicular decomposition with the special direction selected as u hat, you get this. Uh, the rest of it is just kind of algebraic. Notice what I'm doing <coughs> is wherever I see the unit vector, I'm substituting the full vector divided through by its magnitude. Notice that I've done that here, I've done that here, I've done that here, and I do it a fourth time over here. And then I can take those one over magnitudes. Notice each term has two of them. So I can just simply factor those guys out. So I pull off the, the one over u's. And then just because I think it looks prettier, instead of writing magnitude squared, I change it to u dot with itself. That's because I like the look of it. Uh, but wait a minute. What's, what's this thing right here? <coughs> that was the strain rate we just encountered on the previous slide. Uh, yeah, that, that's the equation for the strain rate. Look at this thing right here in the round brackets. <coughs> you notice it looks almost identical to this with one little change. One little but significant change. Whereas the strain rate has a dot product up here, this term has a vector cross product. So it makes, whereas this is a scalar, this guy's going to be a vector. As a matter of fact, this is, a, this is an important vector. We'll see why in a few moments. For now, I'm going to give it a temporary name. We'll call it the capital Q vector. So we're going to define capital Q vector as being this term uh, right here. And it's kind of a big question mark as to what this thing really physically represents. And we'll deal with that, we'll deal with that as we go along. Uh, just to establish consistency, though, let me continue on down the line here. Uh, first of all, by substituting in the definition of the strain rate. And then remember that the vector divided through by its magnitude uh, would be a unit vector. So in the pink column, you will notice that we've come full circle. I can come right around and bring us right back to where we started from so you can see that we've established full consistency on the left column dealing with the parallel component. In order to establish consistency on the right-hand side, I guess we would at some point have to show that the capital Q vector crossed with U was equal to that. Uh, we will do that in the next two slides. We'll show that, in fact, we do have consistency on the right-hand side. Uh, but, but this is what would have to be established in order to do that. All right, so where are we? Well, let's dig into this Q vector a little bit more carefully. On the previous slide, this capital Q vector was defined like that. Now watch what I'm going to do. Just make some substitutions here. Uh, the u dot u in the denominator is just one over the magnitude squared. Notice I substitute for the vector as the product of its magnitude times its direction. And I also substitute for the derivative in terms of that product rule expansion. And at that point, it's just algebra. Um, I take the 1 over u squared, I put 1 over u with the first term, another 1 over u with the second term, and then just clean it up algebraically, like so. Over here, when you bring that in, notice you've got what the strain rate again, rate of change of magnitude, pre magnitude. Then if you expand the cross product through, anytime you cross a vector with itself, of course the result is zero. So this is interesting. What have I established here? In this five lines, we've established that this capital Q vector, which was originally defined like so, evidently could also be computed from this little equation, involving just the unit, just the vector's direction function. Now this is interesting. It's interesting to me because I'll make the point out why I think it's so interesting. The strain rate, the rate of change of magnitude per unit magnitude, which is, is, can be computed from a formula that looks like this. 
the strain rate, would you agree the strain rate depends only on the magnitude portion of the vector? It has nothing to do with the vector's direction. The strain rate is entirely determined by the magnitude part. It's important. But conversely, have we not shown that the Q vector is entirely dependent on the direction and has nothing to do with magnitude? So evidently, all of the magnitude change information is contained in the strain rate. And apparently, all of the direction change information is contained in this Q vector intersection. Uh, there's one other thing we can do with this. Remember we had a missing point of consistency on the previous slide? We were able to show that we came full circle in the pink column, but not quite full circle yet in the blue column. We can do that right now. Because I just showed you that the Q vector has an alternative expression in terms of the unit vector. So if we start off with that, just consider what this will reduce to. Um, the first line of this little proof involves what I like to call a double cross product switch. Take two vectors in a cross product, switch them, you introduce a minus sign, right? Notice what I've done here. Notice what's happened here is I first of all swap the order of this, I swap the order of the vectors in this cross product, putting the dot term first. And then I swap this term with this term. A double cross product switch, minus times minus is a plus. So uh, that's a nice nifty little maneuver. Um, remember something called the double cross product identity? Page one of the general course outline. A cross with B cross with C is equal to C dotted with A times B minus B dotted with A times C. So we're all set up for that. So if I pull out the double cross product identity, we can write that in the following way. And then, of course, a unit vector dotted with itself is 1. And remember, we established that the derivative of the unit vector is perpendicular to the unit vector. So the dot product there is obviously equal to 0. Ah, well, that establishes that if you take this q vector and you cross it with the unit vector, the result will be the derivative of the unit vector. So that the original defined Q vector, which we now have an alternative expression for, also satisfies this equation. And as a matter of fact, that's what you need for that little bit of missing consistency from the previous slide. So if you go back to the previous slide and you make use of this, you can easily show that we have full consistency on both the left and the right hand side. Uh, but that still leaves us a little short. So let's summarize, just pause for a moment. It's very abstract, I suppose. But Let's pause for a moment and see what we've got. Um, first of all, I guess at this point, I've got two different ways to express the derivative. This is what we started with on the top, and then this is what we got from that parallel perpendicular decomposition stuff. And this is written in terms of the strain rate multiplying the vector plus this mystery q vector crossed with the vector. And we have those expressions for the strain rate, and we have these expressions for the mystery q vector. Uh, but I still have a question mark, and that question mark uh, concerns um, the geometric significance of that vector. I I'd like to, rather than just have these mathematical expressions for it, can we, can, we, can we break it down and see what it is physically or geometrically? Does it have a physical or geometric interpretation? And that's the point of the next page of the development. So for this, I'm going to imagine that our little unit vector maybe looks like this at time t. And a little bit later, at t plus delta t. Now, the only thing a unit vector can do is rotate. It won't change its direction. So a little bit later, suppose it looks like this. Um, so I define the angle between the vector at t and t plus delta t. We'll call it delta beta. That will be the angle of rotation. Now, if you bring those two vectors together, unit vector of t, unit vector of t plus delta t, of course, those two vectors are going to determine a plane. Those two vectors lie in what we'll call the t to t plus delta t rotation plane. And within that plane, you can see that it's rotated that way. So notice I've added the right-hand rotation rule normal 
to that point, capital N vector. And again, delta V would be the angle of rotation measured in radians. So this development starts off with uh, this. What would we get if we were to cross? By the way, I'm just going to use, to make the notation simpler, I'm just going to use u hat to represent the original value of the moving vector. And then the updated value will use u hat, the original value, plus the amount that it changed. Okay? And what happens if I cross the original with the updated value of the moving vector? Cross product, magnitude times magnitude times sine of the angle between them, delta beta, and the direction would be the capital N hat that was introduced a moment ago. Make the notational simplifications. Again, the original value, we're just calling it u. The updated value is u plus delta u. Expand the cross product. Oh, and at this step, you'll also notice that on the right-hand side, I've decided to multiply and divide through by delta beta, just because I felt like it. But you'll see the, you'll see the reason in just a moment. Uh, any vector crossed with itself is zero, obviously. I then take the equation and I divide it through by the delta t, the amount of time that has passed. And on the left-hand side, I park that delta t underneath this guy. And on the right-hand side, I park it underneath this guy. <coughs> and then, uh, probably no surprise, you can kind of see it coming through the fog as well, you'll notice that I'm going to take a limit as I shrink delta t to zero. What happens in the limit as we shrink the time interval to zero? Well, the first thing you have to recognize, we're, we're talking about a smoothly varying unit vector function. So if I shrink well, let's put it this way. What happens to the angle of rotation in the limit as delta t shrinks to zero? If it's a smoothly varying function, the angle of rotation is going to go to zero as delta t goes to zero. Uh, so that's the first thing to recognize. But as we take the limit here, <coughs> uh, what you get is this. And of course, I'll have to explain why in each term. Uh, the we'll break it down in steps. The first thing that happens on the left-hand side is that by the definition of derivative, well, what is the derivative of a unit? What's the derivative of anything? The derivative of anything is the change in that thing divided by the change in the independent variable where the limit as delta t goes to zero. So from the very definition of the derivative, limit as delta t goes to zero of delta u over delta t is the time rate of change of that unit vector. So that explains what happened on the left-hand side. Uh, what about the right-hand side? Well, the limit of sine of delta beta over delta beta goes to 1 in the limit. Why? When you take your calculator and you compute, ask it to compute the sine of some sine of x, let's say, uh, what does your calculator do? Sine function is a transcendental function, right? It's defined through an infinite series. So your calculator starts computing terms of an infinite series. And it's smart enough to know how many terms it needs to get the accuracy that's desired. But I think you might remember that the sine function is x minus x, maybe. Is this ring any bells? Remember that? That's what the sine function is. That's the Taylor series expansion for sine. Uh, so what's the Taylor series expansion of sine of x over x? x over x is 1. x cubed over x is x squared, 4, 6, etc. What's the limit of sine of x over x as x approaches 0? Don't hurt yourself. 1. That's the reason why this is true. Because as delta t goes to 0, delta beta goes to 0. And because of this, that term goes to 1. Uh, what about this? This is the angle of rotation measured in radians 
And this is the number of seconds that it took for that rotation to occur, radians per second. So, and the limit is delta t goes to zero. Now, doesn't it make sense that that would be the angular rotation speed, instantaneous angular rotation speed measured in radians per second? So, as you can see by definition of the derivative, this term goes to the rate of change of the unit vector. This becomes one. This is the instantaneous angular rotation speed measured in radians per second. The only other change I will make is I will change the capital N, which was the right hand rotation rule normal to the t to t plus delta t rotation plane. We'll change that to little n. So we'll make that little change right there. And again, in that expression, beta dot represents the unit vector's instantaneous angular rotation speed. And little n hat represents the right hand rotation rule normal to the unit vector's instantaneous rotation plane. Okay? So that's a one. Oh, by the way, <coughs> you can see that this guy right here, <coughs> which was another expression for the Q vector, is a vector which is perpendicular to a rotation plane, <coughs> has a right hand rotation rule sense, and has a magnitude equal to the speed of rotation. Gee, have you ever seen a vector like that before? You all passed your first dynamics class, right? And you did a lot of planar motion analysis, right? So when a rigid body was undergoing planar motion, didn't you have something called an angular velocity vector? And wasn't the angular velocity vector a vector which was perpendicular normal to the plane of rotation? Did it not have a right hand rotation rule sense? And was its magnitude equal to the instantaneous angular rotation speed of the body? Ab absolutely. So this Q vector, evidently, is an angular velocity describing the instantaneous rotation of the vector. How cool is that? So I guess now we can say this establishes the physical meaning of the Q vector, which we have all these different expressions for now, as the vector's instantaneous angular velocity vector, as indeed it is a vector which is normal or perpendicular to the vector's instantaneous plane of rotation, has a right hand rule sense and a magnitude equal to the vector's instantaneous speed of angular rotation. So what you have here is a descriptor of rotation, but notice there's, there's no restriction to any kind of special kind of motion. This vector could be doing anything in three-dimensional space, so this is a, a three-dimensional development of the description of rotation. Uh, but I think that from these observations, I think maybe we're justified in pulling off a name change. you agree? Didn't you use that lowercase omega symbol for angular velocity vectors in your 250? So let's call it what it is. Let's change that temporary name as capital Q. Let's change it to the omega vector, the angular velocity vector of the vector U. Okay. <coughs> And of course, once we've observed all that, now we can go back and re-summarize what we've discovered. Uh, two different ways to express the derivative, very physical ways. Here we're thinking about the two physically important parts of the vector. The physically important parts of the vector are its magnitude and its direction. And we can certainly express the derivative this way, but more elegantly, we can write it this way. Strain rate multiplying scalar strain rate multiplying the vector being differentiated plus the vector's angular velocity vector crossed with the vector that's being differentiated. Strain rate has a physical expression, has a mathematical expression. Angular velocity vector has a physical expression and has two different mathematical expressions. Okay. Let's see if we can't put this all together into one big picture. So let's break this down one piece at a time. Vector function, smoothly varying magnitude, smoothly varying direction. Uh, that smoothly varying vector is going to have an instantaneous, it's going to be contained within its instantaneous rotation plane. And how would you determine what that instantaneous plane is? You look at the vector now, 
and you look at what the vector looks like a millionth of a second later, and then the plane that contains those two vectors would be the instantaneous rotation plane. Uh, within that plane, that vector is going to be rotating at some angular speed and in some either clockwise or counterclockwise direction. Uh, once you've determined those things, you can introduce the right-hand rotation rule normal to the plane. And once you've done that, you can introduce the vector's angular velocity vector, the blue vector. The vector whose magnitude is the rotation speed, or right-hand rotation rule normal to the plane. Okay. Um, hmm. You hat the direction of the vector, the green vector, and the right-hand rotation rule normal to the plane. Are, the, are not those two perpendicular unit vectors? And if one were to cross n hat with u, wouldn't you produce a third unit vector down in the plane? And we were talking a lot about right-hand orthonormal triads, right? So if you look at the direction of a vector, the right-hand rotation rule normal to its plane, and this third direction defined through the crossbar, you've got a nice right-handed orthonormal triad. Remember, in these expressions, beta dot is the instantaneous angular rotation speed. The omega vector is the vector's angular velocity vector. By the way, uh, could we give this new third unit vector, this unit vector, could we give that a name? Well, would you agree that that new unit vector that that are new and you uh, is uh, uh, would you agree that it lies in the plane of rotation? Mm -hmm. Would you also agree that it's perpendicular to the vector? Mm -hmm. Would you agree that it points in the direction towards which the vector is turning? Mm -hmm. and just like someone driving a car along the road, if you think of you hat as being the hood ornament, if a car is turning left, a, a diligent driver would be flashing his turn signal pointing in the direction towards which he's turning. Left hand turn, right hand turn. It seems to me that that third little unit vector that was just penciled in up there is really the vector's turn signal. If you want to use that analogy, I think it's a good one. <coughs> so that third unit vector uh, is the vector's perpendicular in-plane turning direction, or even more succinctly, as I just introduced with that, concept of a, a car's turn signal, we can call it the vector's perpendicular turn signal, the immediate direction towards which it is turning. In any event, remember that the, a vector's derivative has two parts to it. It has one part that is parallel to the vector being differentiated, and we have a couple different expressions for that parallel component. Using this one, you can see that I just penciled in that uh, red dotted line, that would be the parallel component of the derivative. And its magnitude would be the rate of change in magnitude. It's the parallel part. The perpendicular part of the derivative, um, we had uh, one way to express it was the vector's blue angular velocity vector crossed with you. Uh, but look, we can, we can do some more with that if you want. That's probably a good idea. First of all, make this substitution for the angular velocity vector in terms of the normal to the rotation plane. Make this substitution for the vector. Uh, factor out the scalars and do the little cross product. Factor out the scalars and notice n hat crossed with u hat. n hat crossed with u hat is your turn signal direction. <clears throat> so we have yet another way of expressing the perpendicular portion of the derivative. The part of the vector's derivative, which is perpendicular to the vector, is a vector whose magnitude is magnitude of the vector times this rate of angular rotation, angular rotation speed, and it points in the turn signal uh, direction. So we'll pencil that guy in. So in a very physical way, those are the physical components of a vector's derivative. Parallel component relating to the rate of change in magnitude and the perpendicular component whose size is equal to not just the rate of change of magnitude but multiplied by the vector's instantaneous magnitude. Now, of course, it's the sum of those two vectors. <coughs> it's the sum of those two parts that gives you the full vector derivative. 
So it gives us an understanding of why a vector and its derivative will look the way they do. The red vector is the, the, the red vector there is the time rate of change of the green vector. <coughs> Having one component parallel to the vector, one component perpendicular to the vector. And you have these ways of expressing it. Now, I want to uh, do a little exercise here where we're going to apply these equations. But I want to apply them to a case of a smoothly varying unit vector function. Now, as I said right in the beginning, all of this mathematics would work just as well if the variable was something other than time. I chose to use time as the independent variable here because I thought it was easy for us to think about. So what I want to do is I want to apply this mathematics to a unit vector, which is a smoothly varying function of some independent variable that I'll use my favorite little Greek letter that I like to call squiggle. So let's take a look at what would these equations look like if we applied this mathematics to such a smoothly varying unit vector function. A couple things I want to point out. For one thing, if the independent variable is not time, if the independent variable is something other than time, I really shouldn't use angular velocity. Because when you say angular velocity, that sort of implies time dependence, right? It means per second and so on. And I don't want to use strain rate. The dot is always associated with time derivative. So if the variable is something other than time, so if time is not the independent variable, maybe the independent variable is something else, I'll probably change the notation. And if you look on page one of the general course outline, the equations that you see there don't have this. Instead, it just keeps capital omega. It's not called the angular velocity vector. It would be called the angular rotation rate vector. The word velocity is always associated with time dependence. So if the variable is something else, then don't call it an angular velocity. It's like an angular velocity vector. But the unit vector, we'll call it the angular rotation rate vector. Another nice thing about a capital omega, it's got a big space up here. Remember, it's always going to be a rotation rate with respect to changes in something. Uh, so you could actually use your notation, fatten up your notation to identify what the independent variable is. You can use that big piece of real estate up there to, to swiggle in the symbol that, that represents the independent variable. That's kind of cool. And again, if the independent variable is something other than time, rather than use strain rate, I'd probably use something called a capital lambda or something like that. I'd call it maybe a, a rate of stretching or something. Uh, so the notation will change a little bit if the variable is something else. In any event, I just want to make that point. But ask yourself, what's going to happen to these equations that you see here in the picture? What's going to happen to everything if you're dealing with a unit vector function? Well, for a unit vector function, the magnitude is going to be 1, right? So first of all, you can see that that term is going to be used to just this. Not only that, the magnitude of 1 would be constant, so you wouldn't have this term at all. You wouldn't have this term either, right? Because the strain rate of a constant magnitude vector is zero. So the derivative is just going to be like a little cross product thing. Uh, so let's take a look at what these equations will look like if we restrict it to a unit vector function. The picture simplifies tremendously. So if you're looking at a smoothly varying unit vector, of course, a smoothly varying unit vector still has a rotation rate, still has an angular velocity vector, but the derivative is just going to be equal to that. And let me make my notational changes over here on the board because I want to do a little exercise. Let's suppose we have a smoothly varying unit vector. And we'll take the equations there and just simplify them down. Uh, for one thing, the derivative is going to be equal to not the angular velocity, but the rotation rate vector across the new hat. It can also be written as uh, the rate of rotation. Instead of beta dot, it would be d beta dc, the rate of rotation in the turn signal direction. I'm just penciling some things here. This is the instantaneous rate of angular rotation. And this guy right here is the unit vector's uh, instantaneous, uh, instant use perpendicular turn signal. Let's not get too verbose here. Okay. And in these expressions, the angular rotation rate vector, there are a couple ways you can express it. One way would have been equal to the unit vector crossed with its own derivative. And the other way to express it would have been 
in terms of the rate of angular rotation in the right hand rotation rule normal to the unit vector's instantaneous rotation plane. So this is a translation of that mathematics that you see up there to a smoothly varying unit vector function where the independent variable is something called swivel. Now I have an application for these little equations and that comes right here. On Wednesday we talked about smooth space curves that have an arc length coordinate laid off against them. And we were able to show that at every point, well, we know that at every point along the curve there is a special little vector called the unit tangent vector to the path. Now as you move from point to point along the curve, that unit tangent vector is going to vary as a function of s, how far along the path you move. And by the way, I want to remind you, uh, wasn't didn't we go through a fairly detailed exercise, completely a movie, to show Frenet's first formula, the unit tangent to the path, was the uh, rate of change in position with respect to displacement along that path, just to remind you of the first Frenet formula. Well, isn't this an example of a smoothly varying unit vector function? So we ought to be able to immediately apply this mathematics to this situation right here. So I'm going to take the stuff on the left-hand board, and this is what I'm going to do. Everywhere where you see the unit vector d hat, turn it into e sub t. Wherever you see the variable swiggle, we're going to turn it into the independent variable, in this case, is the variable s. Uh, what other substitutions are we going to make? Let's see. Wherever you see, uh, wherever you see the symbol um, this guy, Wherever you see this, that's the unit vector's perpendicular return signal direction. We're going to turn that into what Frenet defined it to be. Frenet defined the principal normal to the path, E sub n, the principal normal to the path, as the tangent vector's turn signal. So we'll use his notation. And likewise, whenever we see n hat in these equations on the left-hand board, that's, that was the right-hand rotation rule normal to the unit vectors for instantaneous rotation plane. We'll again follow Frenet's notation. He defined the right-hand rotation rule normal to the instantaneous turning plane. He defined that to be the binormal unit vector, the binormal E sub B, the secondary normal. And this right-hand rotation rule normal to the tangent vector's instantaneous rotation plane. And one other substitution that I will make is in these equations where you see the instantaneous rate of angular rotation. Wherever you see this d beta d swivel, we're going to replace that with what Frenet called it, the curvature. Of course, the independent variable is s. So Frenet defined kappa, Greek letter kappa. He defined d beta ds, the rate of rotation of the tangent vector with respect to distance traveled. He defined that as the curvature, curvature of the path. Okay, so if we just take the mathematics from the left-hand board and make all of those substitutions, let's do it. And we can throw in that little extra bit that we developed on Wednesday. <coughs> so the first line translates to this. The second line translates into the derivative of e sub t with respect to independent variable s is equal to um, the angular rotation rate vector for the tangent vector crossed with e sub t, which is also equal to times this, which is going to be uh, the curvature in the principal normal direction. Curvature kappa in the principal normal direction. 
And then the final line uh, translates down to the fact that the rotation rate vector for the tangent vector is equal to e sub t cross the derivative of e sub t with respect to s, which is also equal to the curvature, curvature in the binomial direction. Okay? And that's just a direct application of the mathematics that we just reviewed. Um, let me pull out of this little box probably the most important relationships. The two most important relationships that you see here are this one, first of all, that uh, the <coughs> rate of change for a smooth space curve, the rate of change of position vector with respect to displacement is the unit tangent vector. And I guess the second most important relationship contained in these boxes is that the uh, rate of change of the tangent vector with respect to displacement, derivative of the tangent with respect to S, <coughs> is equal to the curvature in the principal normal direction with the reminder here that curvature by definition is the rate of rotation of the tangent vector with respect to distance traveled along the curve. Now I need to comment on this. This again is what Frenet defined to be the curvature. And we probably should take some <coughs> take a few moments to justify why he decided to call it that. The <coughs> logic goes something like this. I'm going to draw two curves. And uh, Curve one and curve two. If the word curvature is to mean anything, which of those two curves would you say had the most of it? Which has the most curvature? Right. <coughs> Obviously the second one. So let's, let's justify that. Uh, um, let's take two points along this curve that are roughly 12 inches apart. And that's about 12 inches. So let's look at two curves that are a certain distance delta s apart. And we'll do the same thing over here. We'll, take two points that are essentially in the same distance, more or less. Huh? Uh, so we'll take those two curves that are the same two points on each curve that are the same distance apart. Over here, the tangent vector, do you agree that at this point the tangent vector looks like this? And then at this point, the tangent vector looks something like this, yes? And if you try to do a little geometric construction, you kind of see that in case number one, the tangent vector would have rotated by about that much. Whereas over here, for the same distance traveled, notice that the tangent vector would have rotated significantly more, yes? Um, and to sort of draw, do a little construction, you can see that the rotation of the tangent vector in case two for a given distance traveled is much greater than it was over here. In other words, if you look at the ratio of delta beta, the rotation of the tangent vector measured in radians to the distance traveled, you get a much bigger value over here than you do over here. Now, of course, this would represent the average curvature over that length. If you take a limit as delta s goes to zero, of course, uh, in the limit as delta s goes to zero, you get the rate of rotation of the tangent with respect to, to the distance traveled. But as you can see, that ratio of radians of rotation experienced by the tip to the distance travel is a, is a beautiful measure of how curved the path is. Okay? Now here's a simple one for you. The simplest curve that I know of is a straight line. Uh, is it obvious what the curvature of a straight line is? Don't hurt yourself. Is it obvious that a straight line has no curvature whatsoever? Because as you displace along the straight line, does the tangent vector rotate? No, delta beta is zero. So the curvature of the straight line is zero. Um, uh, the next most popular curve, would you agree that a circle is a, is a pretty popular curve? Certainly one we see a lot of, right? So what if you have a circle of radius r? Do you remember what the curvature of a circle is of radius r? I had someone in the previous class who remembered it from the calculus class. Come on, they're not better than you, are they? <laughs> what's, the, what's the curvature of the circle? No one? 
Maybe it'll help you if you look at the units. What are the units of curvature? Radians of radians is the mention. Is it obvious that curvature has units of one over length? Mm -hmm. That'll help you make a guess. Okay, well, you're not. No one's biting, so let's uh, let's show you. <laughs> I've drawn a circle, a radius r, and I've chosen two points along the circle, here and here. I've chosen two points on the circle that are, uh, uh, ang that are displaced by an angular amount of delta theta radians. Is it clear right at the very top right that the distance measured along the path between those two points is the radius times delta theta? Mm -hmm. Is it also obvious from this that I notice I've drawn I've constructed a straight line through the second point, which is parallel to original E sub t. So you can see the delta beta, see the angle of rotation of the tangent. Now, is it clear that this dotted line is perpendicular to this, and that is perpendicular to this? So is it equally obvious that the rotation angle for the tangent vector is exactly the same as this angle right here? Uh, so it's got everything you need, I think. Uh, all you have to do is remember what the curvature is. Curvature is d beta ds. That's the limit as delta s goes to zero of the rotation of the tangent to the distance traveled. But for a circle, the rotation of the tangent would be equal to delta theta, and the distance traveled would be r delta theta. <coughs> and therefore, you don't even have to take a limit because the curvature of a circle, of course, is constant and equal to what? one over the radius of the circle. The units check out, right? So the curvature of the circle is one over its radius. Uh, we'll just make one final comment, and then we'll, we'll call it quits for the week. Um, curvature of a straight line is zero. Curvature of a circle is one over its radius. Um, coming back to this equation, Mathematicians would probably write this second Frenet formula in terms of the curvature. Engineers are more likely to write this equation in terms of the radius of curvature. The radius of curvature is defined to be 1 over the curvature, and that is defined as the radius of curvature. And by the way, going back to the straight line, if that's indeed what the radius of curvature is, what's the radius of curvature of the straight line? Infinity. 1 over 0 would be infinity. And uh, the radius of curvature of a circle would be radius. the radius. I bet you that's why it was introduced that way. Uh, why do engineers prefer, last comment of the week, why do, engin why do you suppose engineers prefer to write the equation in terms of the radius of curvature? Well, here's my thought on the matter. Uh, the engineers like to be able to estimate things. Helpful. So if you wanted to estimate the radius of curvature at some point along some path, this is what you would do. You would just say, hmm, let's look at a small piece of the curve in the vicinity of that point. And if you look at it, does that kind of look like it was a little segment snipped out of some circle? Well, the extent to which you can visualize the size of the circle that that was snipped out of, you would have a visual estimate of the radius curvature of the path at that point. By the way, is it there, does that correspond to the fact that the radius of curvature of a straight line is infinite? Because if you look at any portion of the straight line, it looks like it was taken out of the circumference of an infinitely sized circle. Okay, so we'll leave it there and pick it up on the Let's just get some uh, particle dynamics problems.